everyone. Uh, it's, it's awesome to, to be here today. Um, there's something I love more than uh, uh, speaking to those who, who run our government um, and our governments across the, the country and the world because, you know, you guys are the, are the, are the change makers. Uh, you're people who are both doing technology and it's, it's my absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I am, I guess, what I've, what I've in the past called a data storyteller. Uh, what's that mean? It means that I'm actually a computer scientist. Uh, I did a, a PhD in something very nerdy called natural language processing. Um, but I also married an urban pa uh, who worked in government. Uh, and uh, she uh, worked uh, originally in the mayor's office of uh, industrial retention in New York City. And eventually uh, as a chief of staff for a city council member. So I've seen kind of different branches in action. But what really got me into this work is when she went and took a statistics class at, at the Pratt Institute. Uh, and when she took that class, I realized that She'd go through the book and say, this is silly. These statistics are dumb. I was like, no, it's not dumb. It's cool. And I realized that everyone is teaching students statistics using made-up problems. When we all have real problems, it seems crazy. So I went to the university, and I said, hey, I have an idea. Can we?" Because I, I, I was watching her take the class, and I said, can you let me teach this class? Take all open data, which were just starting to kind of arise four or five years ago, coming into a, a lot more cities. And I'm going to redesign the course so that when they're learning about some statistic, at least it's on something they care about. Uh, and they said, okay. And suddenly I'm teaching, a, a, I'm a visiting professor at the Pratt Institute, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I've been teaching that class there for a bunch of years. But what, what I learned doing that, that there's so much interesting information because I needed to make this homework cool. I needed to make this homework fun because who cares about data? Who cares about math, right? Well, people should. So I set off on this goal and that led me to kind of basically starting to tell the stories I found. Um, so originally, as I was writing this talk for today, I was really thinking about it as tourism. But I, you know, I guess I'm bait and switch. I'm actually, as I thought about it more, it's more like uh, uh, anthropology, right? It's more digging. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about data as the trails we kind of leave behind, right? When people go and study old civilizations, they go through their garbage. How do you think people are going to study us? I mean, I'm guessing our data. I'm, I'm guessing our, a lot of our data, right? We're going to understand. So these are actually kind of these crumbs that we're leaving behind for the future. The funny thing is you don't have to wait till the future to actually learn about things, right? because there's a lot more rich information in data than maybe in, in, in ceramics that you dig up, um, because there's so many different ways you can go. So what I did is I set off for about a year. Um, I mean, I work full time, so this is here on, on the side. And I just went on Google and I typed open data city. And I clicked on every single thing for like 25, 30, 40 pages. And I just went through maybe 100 open data, 150 open data portals from cities. Most happened to be the United States because of the way they were ranked in Google but some were in Europe. And, and I started to just pull the stories and get familiar with look different and how, how these cities you know, show different. And the problem was, what became very apparent, is you can't really compare cities too well because everyone tells their stories differently. Take crime data. There were, every single city had a different set of data they want to give you. Every single one. I mean, I mean not, maybe probably not literally everyone, but there's probably 45 different ways, right? In one city, they might tell you what occurred. What type of location? Was it in a building, a parking lot? Was it in a, was it in a, a, a house? You don't get that in any other cities. Another city might tell you the, the police response time. You don't get that in the other cities. So you have all these different points. So I'm going to tell you some stories I learned. And I can't claim that they're specifically about the cities I go into. They're probably more about kind of the way we act as humans. And that's going to be my first part. And this is all work I've done for a book that um, I'm working on with uh, Riverhead, uh, which hopefully, if I can finish it up, um, will, will come out sometime in the next six to nine months, maybe a little longer. Um, and then after that, I'm going to sort of peel that back. We're going to tell you what we learned about ourselves and then talk about how we can actually use that to affect change. So I'll start crime because I did see a lot of crime data. That's one of the main categories that seem people seem to post. And I'm going to start basically where I live, New York. And, I, and I, you know, I look at data and I just look for interesting things. And I always assumed that when would robberies happen? Those Robbery is somebody taking something from you by force, right? You would always assume that there's going to be more robber night. Right? But, I, but I charted this. This is the hour of the day from midnight to midnight in New York City. The number of robberies per hour, crimes committed per hour in the city. And what do you see? A bump at 3 p.m. These are, what, 3 p.m.? Now, obviously, there's more people out, so there's going to be more robberies, maybe. But 3 p.m., what happens at 3 p.m.? And, and this was very confusing until I realized something, and it was kind of my worst kind of, I was like, well, I guess one thing that happens at 3 p.m. is school gets out. So I went and I, I broke this into uh, uh, school days, weekends, and then vacation weekdays. And I replotted it. The blue line is school days. The, uh, the orange days where kids are on vacation. And the gray is weekend. 
So what do we see here? We see, yes, there's a pretty strong correlation between when kids are getting out of school, uh, out, of, out of probably high school, and uh, when these crimes are committed. And what does that, that starts to teach us something about our city, right? The kind of thing that I could never have gotten in the past because I used crime counts per precinct in a PDF file once a, once a month. You can't, you can't learn about that, right? What does it say about the need for after school activities? What does it say about, you know, how, how there's a lot of things you can dig in here. And obviously, I'm only seeing a piece of the data. Our agencies, our government can see a lot more of this data and start to learn from it and make really changes. But this is the first time that we as citizens start to see this, and it's a very exciting time. Um, another data set, this is kind of a known effect, but I just charted it out because I was fascinated. This is uh, the number of crimes per day versus temperature in Chicago. So we can see that when it's negative two, it's around 600. And as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, there's more and more crime. And then at around degrees, it starts to just kind of plummet. The difference between like 92 and 97 is fascinating to me. Um, that, I mean, I, I think we can all feel that outside today, that it's not really, you know, I was gonna commit a crime on the way over, but I was too hot. Um, <laughs> so I get that, I get that feeling. Um, you can, you can, you know, you can really start to, to and, and you could do this by type of crime. So I took every time and I just correlated it with temperature. Correlation, so I broke it down. Um, I'll read a few because I know it might be small for some of you, but all the way, the most correlated with temperature are assault, battery, theft, gambling, criminal damage, uh, robbery, burglary, weapons violations, 40 and 30% correlations just with temperature, right? The things that are totally uncorrelated with temperature, narcotic, uh, uh, stalking, prostitution, uh, uh, criminal trespass, which is odd, you think people, I don't know. But, um, so I don't know, you can start to really learn, and how, what does this tell us about, you know, our cities, where we should deploy resources? I mean, what does this tell us about ourselves? And uh, it was interesting. Um, I went to Sacramento, which had uh, uh, 911 data, which was quite awesome. It was a lot more granular than what we had in New York because it actually had the time that a call came in and then the time that an officer arrived at the scene, okay? So this is the 911 call chart for time of day. You can see that at 4, 5 a.m. there's less 911 calls, okay? But you can kind of see it creep up. But watch this. Want to see the arrival times? Is that, right? That's when the people call. Here's your arrival times. That doesn't make you scratch your head. I don't, I don't know what wouldn't, right? What, what could possibly cause this? So, so I, I smoothed them and put them on top of each other. The red is what time people, the number of uh, officers arriving at the scene per minute, and the blue is the number of calls. So you know what those three bumps are? Shift changes. Interesting. That means that all these, uh, uh, all these sort of drops there, all the people who would have been arriving there if there were not a shift change, are actually arriving half an hour later. Now, these are not going to be the most severe of crimes, I'm sure. In fact, I broke it down and checked, and you don't see this effect for, you know, gang, you're not going to see this, but for, hey, um, my house has been broken into, you know, if you call at certain times, so the worst time to call 911 is right before the shift change. This is not just about Sacramento. This is just where the data was available, um, but it's kind of an interesting, interesting finding there. Uh, I was interesting about uh, age and crime, and Miami has a very in-depth about arrests. Maybe a little too in depth, and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. But um, uh, so here is a distribution of the age of people committing different crimes, and you can see concealed weapons is sort of the red plot, and that happens from like 18 to sorry, the the, the graph got shrunk when I when I put it over, but like 18 to 30 is when people get arrested for concealed weapons. Mid late 20s, DUIs start and come up, and then they kind of drop, and then just alcohol-related offenses start in the 30s and kind of peak in the 60s. So we can start to see how age affects, you know, what we're doing in our cities in, in different ways. You can see the different life cycles that people go through in, within the look of, of crime. Um, another thing about Miami is they have arrest records, and they, they, they give you, this is open data on everyone who's arrested, not convicted, which is kind of, I hadn't seen that. There might be some other cities that have that. But it's every arrest. So it's got their name, their birthday, um, I think their address, but I don't recall now. Um, and uh, so I decided to say, okay, well, who's been arrested the most times? And so, and I kept finding this weird thing. I found these people where there'd be two people with the same name, and they'd both, there'd be like only two people in the whole database with this name, and they both were arrested 10 times, but they're different people. It's like, that doesn't make sense. And as I started to go through, uh, I, I started to realize that basically uh, there is, uh, for example, this guy, R. Robin, part of his name, um, it, there were two people in the database. One whose birthday was May 25th, 1963, who was arrested 14 times, and one whose birthday was May 25th, 1964, who was arrested 20 times. Suspicious, right? Then I, I saw this pattern over and over again. Uh, uh, someone, uh, 42451, 42451, four times. So what are we seeing? We're seeing people change their birthday when they got arrested. 
And they're always, it's hard to remember, right? So they always only change one number. They either change their year or their month. And you can see it in the data, and they're all sort of listed as different people. Now, I don't know what happens downstream in Miami. I can't speak to that. But at least in this particular data set, you can really see people try to be tricky and, and, and try to uh, uh, get caught getting arrested too many times. Um, uh, so, you know, this, on, the, on, the on the bottom there, you see 521.71 e-freshman was arrested eight times, 525.71 three times. So there's the only two people in the whole database with that name, and yet somehow they both have a huge number of arrests, right? So we're seeing people kind of try to play around. Once again, available because of data. Now, sometimes I think things go a little far. This was, this was kind of puzzling to me. Um, this was a, uh, a data set called Miami-Dade Waste Accounts, okay? This is 475,000 rows of people who get their garbage picked up, which sounds like everybody. And then I, but, um, well, I looked up, it's about half of all households. And then within there, I saw their address, owner, phone numbers, and names, which seemed like an odd, uh, an odd, an odd thing of, of oversharing. Um, so we, I think we have, to be, we have to sometimes be careful in what, in what we share, even if it's sort of technically public. Um, I blocked out the names here. But that's 425,000 address name pairs. That's because they get garbage picked up. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we should be careful. Um, other things I looked at was, was, was human bias, right? Uh, this is, uh, uh, well, first, um, in Baton Rouge, every time animal control reports to a, uh, responds to a, uh, an animal incident, they have to classify, they have to decide every animal they respond to is either normal, dangerous, uh, friendly, or nervous, okay? So imagine you had to classify every animal. So one thing I learned is that all armadillos are normal. <laughs> like hundreds, hundreds. All armadillos are normal in Baton Rouge. It's good to know. Uh, but then you can start to consider dangerous based on their breed. Um, obviously, bull, uh, we have bulldogs and pit bulls, and then some cats in there. DSH was domestic short hair. You see chows, Rottweilers. Um, this, this isn't surprising. Rottweilers spelled differently because it's, you know, public data. It's all data. Data's messy. Um, and that, that was what's in there. You can look at what people thought, who everyone thought were cows are just kind of nervous. Maybe it's their black tongue, and they're just kind of sitting there. I don't know. And then, and then the cats are all very nervous, I guess. So 40% of cats were nervous. 40% of cats were nervous. 45% of chows were nervous, OK? But this starts to get, like, this starts to ask, who, who is deciding this, right? As we, you know, in any interaction, if you, would they come up with something different? And this fascinated me. It has obviously, obviously repercussions for humans as well. But this is a great laboratory to play, to play with that. So for example, I took each of the six respondent officers, and I did what percent of dogs they thought were dangerous, and what percent of cats they thought were dangerous. And we can right away see who's a dog person and who's a cat person. <laughs> or, I think 20% of cats are dangerous. I don't know what TR is up to. Um, whereas, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, whereas, you know, someone else, I guess BG just thinks no one's dangerous. I got this, right? Um, uh, so we, you know, we can start to think about the, what, is this, what kind of implications does this have. Look, I don't, this can be released on, on humans, right, in the same way. We're very comfortable releasing this on animals. How can we use animals as laboratories to think about our own biases? Um, and, uh, uh, um, and in fact, uh, if you go and, oh, I think this is in the room. Hold on. Let's see. Oh, there we go. That was the one. In fact, if you ask the color of black cats, we're considered three times more dangerous than white cats. Now, there's no science here. There's no science here. If you look it up, there's no science that says the color of a cat is correlated with its temperament. But our officers feel that the color, you know, and you know, you a million reasons you might think that's the case. But it's fascinating. It's fascinating to look at. And once again, I would challenge people who have access to this kind of data in other areas to, to take a deeper look where I don't have access because it opens up a lot of interesting questions about how we think and our own biases, right? Um, another thing I noticed was, you know, the breeds of dogs that were in the pound most often in Austin versus LA. The number one dog in LA, of course, is Chihuahua, OK? Whereas in, uh, in Austin, uh, or, uh, labs are common in, in both places. You can have some fun there. Um, another thing, I was looking at income. What does income say about us? And I was fascinated. If you just take every, uh, uh, if you take every zip code in, the, in New York, and you take the median income of that zip code, and then you take the percentage of cars of every type in that zip code, you can see what your luxury car, like, People with more money, what type of cars do they buy? Because just because something costs more money doesn't mean that people with more wealth might buy it. So I got this list here that was just pulled up of you know, the cars most correlated with wealth and lease. And you can see on the end, you have BMW, Audi, Lexus, Tesla. On the bottom, Pontiac, Chrysler, Chevrolet, Dunn. And uh, 
I, you know, I did the same thing with color, and I guess my question is, what colors do you think the most, what do you think is the most wealthy color? And what do you guys think? Red. So, what is that? Black. Silver? Black, all right, let's see. Yeah, so black, gray, and white were the only ones positively correlated, whereas red and maroon most negatively correlated with wealth. Which is kind of interesting, another way to look at things. Um, speaking, of, uh, uh, speaking of money, so this is, uh, uh, Looking at, uh, our, our, I guess our procrastination, I'm gonna call it, is a nice way to put it. This is purchase of paper in, uh, in Somerville, uh, in Massachusetts, uh, and their fiscal year ends. <laughs> just, just wondering. That's monthly spend of, uh, of, on paper. Quick, 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 I know, I know, you know, once you have a budget, you have to use it, right? It's a weird way things are set up. Uh, and you can really see it in some of this, in some of this public data. Uh, another question I had, do people tip more on Christmas? New York City cabs? And the answer is, sure. <laughs> there it is, there's Christmas. I calculated it out, it was something like 35 cents per ride on average. Um, but it does show up, it's actually pretty significant. You can also see a little bump on New Year's. Um, uh, but quite small, quite small, smaller than I'd expected. Uh, uh, other, other things having to do with money, you know, you ever, you ever get a park, you ever get a ticket in a garage? Um, this, is, this is a great data set, by the way. This is from Cedar Rapids, and they just have the entry time and exit time of every car going in and out of the garage. I mean, who, what can you do with that? I don't know, but this sounded fun to me. This is a great data set. And they had like lot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but no description of what the lot numbers were. So I've, I Googled and Googled. I don't know what lot eight is, but I do know that in lot eight, I saw something kind of fun. Um, I was curious how people react when they're, you know, they're paying on different increments. I looked up the charge there, and, and the, you know, there's these half hour amounts. So I was wondering, hey, is, are you gonna see a difference right after 30 minutes? And I zoomed in, 30 minutes is the red line. The least common time to park in the garage are 31 minutes, 32 minutes, and 33 minutes. So people must be hustling back to that car uh, uh, to say, I don't wanna pay that extra 25 cents. And, uh, uh, and they're running back and you can see it, you can see that little drop there in, in the data from Cedar Rapids. Um, sometimes you have to go and look outside the box to find information. That's because part of the larger, part of, let's talk a little bit about the larger point here. The larger point is that, that data sometimes is put out and you don't, no one knows what you're gonna do with it, right? Um, uh, there are things that are obvious to do and there are things that you'll never know that someone might do with it until you put it out there and give people that opportunity. So here I'm kind of messing around and I'm gonna show you some actual things that, that can actually imp sort of studying, studying us and, and, and what that means. Um, but uh, uh, I think that like the, the general idea uh, is that you never know how data is gonna be used until it's put out there and people have that opportunity. Um, Another thing I was wondering is when do people decorate for Christmas? And you know, no one had open data on, on Christmas decorations, but there, was, there is data on, on uh, emergency room visits and it's tagged by what caused the emergency room visit, including a Christmas ornament tag. So if you take the number of hospital visits by Christmas ornaments or Christmas decorations and plot it, you get this plot. Uh, the orange is Thanksgiving. So we can really see that we start to decorate for Christmas or to go to the ER for Christmas-related injuries around Thanksgiving. I can't prove that you're decorating. I can prove that you're going to the ER because of, oh, you can also do like combination of like ladder and lights. That's pretty obviously what it is. Um, uh, every, you know, it's all coded. And then you can see the red line of Christmas there and you see a little green, that's New Year's Day, and then it kind of falls off. Um, we're putting up decorations, I guess. Uh, uh, so what did I also learn? I learned that it's safer to take down Christmas decorations and put them up. It's pretty clear from this, from this, from this chart. Another great example of things that we you wouldn't expect uh, uh, people to, to glean from your information. Um, you know, uh, also I was, I was interested in superstition and how different is superstition. Uh, this I could kind of compare and I found this kind of fun way to gauge it, right? I, I think it's kind of fun. So I took and I looked at the lot number, like the address numbers of all the buildings in different cities. And I was curious how, do, how low, I, I, you know that there's no 13th floor in a lot of buildings? It turns out, People also skip the address 13. I don't know if you knew this. So here's three cities, New York, LA, and Boston. And you can see this dip. That's the number of buildings whose address is 13, okay? So it looks like maybe Boston is, a, is you know, a little bit most scared of 13 compared to these other cities. Um, uh, you can do this for other numbers. I, New York is, was this. There's not only a dip at 13, but at 113, 213, and 313. Just keeps going. People are that scared of 13 that they can't have their address number be 213 something. There's way more 215s, 211s, 210s. That's not, but the red lines there is 113, 213, 313. Okay. Then um, I looked at 666. 
And I was like, there's nothing there. This disappointed me. And then I was like, I know where there might be a dip in 666. So I opened up some data from Utah. <laughs> there it is, 666. There are half as many 666s in Utah as there are 668s, right? There's a th you know, so, but not in New York. New York, New York doesn't see Utah does. Um, this brought me back to other things I only saw in Utah, um, were, which were dips in two numbers, both 13 and, for some reason, 69. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's, that's the way it is. Um, OK. So, so look, once again, this is, this is about uh, uh, studying or study ourselves. It's not just to, to tell you stories, right? The, these, these are examples of things that you can start to peel back and understand what's happening. And these things have real implications. When we talk about uh, uh, biases, when we talk about the way we act, right, that affects how we all operate. That affects how, uh, how um, someone responding to something operates. Uh, so I'm going to sort of shift gears here, talk a little more in depth about some of the policy implications about some of this stuff, and, and sort of leave behind the, this, um, this depth, this archaeological dig through, uh, through data sets to understand uh, humanity. Um, so this is a map, um, and it's kind of gross, but it's a map of uh, what's called fecal coliform. Uh, which is a bacteria that's in sewage uh, in, in waterways. So this is New York, um, and the bigger the dot, I'll, t I'll tell you what that means in a minute, but in, in essence, the dirtier the water. Um, and this is, this is, I don't know how much, well, you're, you know, many of you, depending on what agency you're in, might be familiar with combined sewer outflow. So in New York and with a lot of other cities, right, our, our septic and our, our sewers from the street and from our toilets go to the same place, and that's a really efficient until it rains really hard, and then that's a really bad idea. And then I picture someone in a room like pulling a level, a little bit lever, and, uh, but in reality it has to go out somewhere and so it goes into our waterways. So this happens, you know, not, it's not totally rare. It's not weird to go to a beach in New York and see a sign that says, um, that happens sometimes. Uh, doesn't sound fun. Uh, but what they do is they go and every week they test for this bacteria. This is a really interesting data set because it's like, uh, I, uh, it's like milliliter or mi like grams per liter of this bacteria or something. I don't remember the units. Something that none of us could relate to. When you're telling a story with data, you need to find something that, and if I mapped the number of milliliters per gram per this, per that, no one would care. No one would care. They'd say, that doesn't mean anything to me. So when you're trying to tell a story, you have to find what means something to somebody. And I thought about this, and there's a couple problems here. Um, one is, I couldn't use averages, because it's a very, it's a very uh, spiky data, right? It's normally okay, and then it rains okay, and then it's okay for a while, and then it rains, and it's really bad, and then it comes in. So if I took an average, what would that really tell us? Not much. If I took a median, that would also kind of be uninteresting. It would, you know. And the average is weird, because I don't care if it's 100 times or 50 times, it's bad as bad, right? So you have to kind of relate to people when you're using data. And I thought about it for a while, and I realized, here's what percent of the time would you get in the water, and it would be illegal to swim? That I can reach people with. People understand those numbers. Make sure you talk in units that people understand, or they're just not going to listen to you. What percent of the time can you get in the water in this location, and it would be illegal to swim? All right? So then that brings us to this port, which is not Coney Island that you swim in. It's on the other side. 94% of samples taken over the previous seven years that I looked at this had levels so high it would be illegal by New York state law to get in the water. That's a number people can stick with. If I used average milliliters, nobody cared. Right? Um, this is the kind of thing that I kind of brought up and, and, you know, data. Outliers tell stories. Everyone, look at your data and find outliers. <laughs> Either it's bad data or interesting. Take any data, sort it, or count, and take the outliers, and either it's bad data, in which case you should fix it, or there's a story to tell, in which case you can act on it. That's what all I, all I did. I do a lot of this. I just look through data and find the most anything is interesting. The least anything is interesting. The fastest taxi driver, the most efficient one. That's, I want to meet that person. What's that person doing? The person who you know, is overcharging, the, who knows? The most anything is interesting, and that's where you can find a lot of stories. Anyway, in this case, I wrote about it, nothing really happened, and then, and then two years later, I caught this article. So that's, um, I, you can see the caption, poop shoot, the slurry entered the creek through the storm drain near Shell Road and Shore Parkway. So this is an example where, where the city finally kind of found this and was able to kind of act on it. Uh, and, but sometimes the data is right in front of our nose. Are, are, we, are we all using it or are we just putting it out there? Right? Are we just putting it out because I was legislated and I have to put it up? That's what the law says because the legislative branch is doing this, or are we using it because we actually can use it to do our jobs? Um, and I, you know, sometimes I'm wondering that when I find things that, that sort of lead this way. Let's look at our own data, right? Let's, let's, let's see our agencies you know, do, do more of this. And I know a lot of you guys are doing that, which is awesome. Um, 
So uh, that's, that's a real example. I'll show you a few more. I, for the first time, New York, about uh, in 2017, released their budget in an open format. This is really exciting. Um, it used to be only in PDF form. And what I learned, because my, my wife was at the city council, was that our legislators were given PDF files, and they were voting on this budget. And obviously, it's thousands of pages. And how can you actually, like, what can you actually, like, if you're not given tools, right? We, if, if you have this data database and you make it into a PDF file and you hand it to our legislators, like, what do you want them to do? They're going to go, to, they're going to find the thing they care most about and they're going to look at it, but they can't take a, no one can look at it. It's ridiculous. So um, I went into the budget. This was after it already passed and they finally released it. And I looked at the largest item in the budget. And according to this document that had been published in the PDF form and they had voted and passed, the largest budget item was $791 million spent on protecting foreign missions. Sounds a little off, right? Um, it was 1% of the entire city budget going to protecting foreign missions. Now, it turns out that this was, a, that someone had filled in this field wrong, but it is the typo that everyone voted and passed, which means that none of the legislators saw the largest item of $791 million typo. We passed this budget and no one saw it. What's that say about our use of data, right? We need to empower people with the tools we're building with open data. We need to bring that into our agencies, whether it's a branch. Um, we need to allow people to use this stuff because we, th the fact that this is happening, what does that say about how close we can actually watch what's happening in our cities? This, should, this type of thing shouldn't happen. We shouldn't accidentally pass a $791 million typo. Um, so, what, you know, the city responded, we're working on fixing this misprint, was their, was their response. Uh, 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 but, you know, it, it, it was still in an, a few more examples. And I've talked about this a little bit, but I want to give you a little bit of backstory. I saw this, this chart in uh, 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 business, Bloomberg Business Week. And it was about how much we tip in New York City. Uh, and it said, hey, look, there are these bumps at 20, 25, and 30%, which if you've ever driven in a cab in New York, when you, when you go to pay at the end by credit card, they say, do you want to 5, 30, or other? So the fact that there's bumps at 20, 25, and 30 makes sense. But what didn't make sense to me was that there's a huge, uh, uh, there's a huge, uh, 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 actually, I'll show you something else first. They also show that there's a big bump in tips after 5 p.m., after 4 p.m. The 1% higher tip at every trip. And you say to yourself, they're telling us the story of ourselves. Oh, you all tip 1% more after 4 p.m., and, and you like to tip this way. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense, right? Um, it doesn't pass a sniff test. Uh, of course, there's something called post hoc rationalization. I'm sure we've all experienced it. When you see a data, it looks weird, and someone asks you to explain it, you can usually explain it, right? Well, on Tuesday, and so they do this. Put smart people in a room and explain a graph, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to explain whatever you find, right? Doesn't matter what it is. Po it's post hoc rationalization. In this case, they reached out to the executive director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, and um, the response was, during rush hour, people appreciate the privacy and convenience of a taxi more than being packed in a subway. Most of the riders who take taxis tend to talk more to drivers and have a more sensitive understanding of driver economics. So the claim is, once seeing this chart, is that those who ride the taxi at 4 p.m. are more sensitive people, and thus the tip goes up 1%. I don't know. I, that, just feels, that just feels not right, right? But that's what's being printed. It's in our magazines. It goes out. Um, well, what, the other thing I noticed is the disparity. Why is everyone tipping 21% and nobody tipping 19%? Because those are people typing in numbers, right? They're hitting other, and they're typing in numbers. What, what is that about? That's not, that's, that is not, is everyone going to be like, I'm not tipping 20, I'm tipping 21. I'm not going to hit this button. And no, that doesn't make sense. Something was wrong. Often we ask and question them, right? If it doesn't look right, don't just try to explain it by, by putting people in a room. Go and double check things. In this case, I went to recreate it using, using public data and got to wondering, well, what do you tip on? 20% of what? Uh, is it the fare? Is it the surcharge? Is it this tax from our, from our mass transit? Tolls, right? And it turns out the answer is it depends, on the, uh, it depends on the manufacturer of the computer in the back of the cab. That there are creative mobile technologies in Verifone, right? They both run the systems. One programmer had programmed the taxi to tip on top of the base fare. The other one actually to tip on top of tolls, taxes, and everything. So what happened is when they went into this analysis, their math is wrong. It wasn't that people were tipping more. It was that the, the, they're, they were tipping on a higher number that they didn't include in their math, right? So it was, it, you know, the whole story. And in fact, why was there a bump in tipping at 4 p.m.? Because there's a rush hour surcharge of $1 that people are now tipping, but the person who wrote the article was not using that in their math. So there's no difference in tipping. It's the same. It's just that we're telling ourselves that that's a, that's a story. Um, so if you, if you redo it, it looks like this. Ah, this feels much better. 
there's kind of a tip around 13%, 14% is what people do in their head. And then you can really see about half the riders hit the 20% button, 10% hit 30, and this looks a lot more sane. So when I pointed this out, um, uh, that there's this disparity, uh, I got my favorite government quote of all time, and I've shared this with some of you before, but it's just too good. We appreciate that work that went into his analysis and we're giving it a thorough read. <laughs> it was awesome, it was a good one. Um, of course, two weeks ago, half the cabs in New York City, now everybody tips on top of tolls and taxes. <laughs> so if you come to New York and you go through a toll, just know that you're, you're paying the driver more. And by the way, why was this a problem? I mean, the drivers with one of the systems in the back were making three to four hundred dollars more a year than the other drivers, right? Because of all the people who hit these buttons. So it's not that I, you know, than the way it was before, at least it's consistent. It seemed kind of unfair and not because, and, and through a very highly regulated industry. The taxes in New York are very highly regulated, but somehow this slipped through until open data kind of told the story. Uh, which was exciting. Um, a few more, one that I've, I've mentioned before but I wanted to, to add to. These are health inspection scores in New York City. We get letter grades in our windows and all. Um, uh, so if you go and uh, you get one and two point violations, your milk is not cold enough, your, you know, the, your sink is, not, is too far away from here, you're preparing food wrong, um, and you get these violations, there's, there's insects, whatever it is, uh, and if you get more than 13 points, you have to put a big B in your window instead of an A more than 27 points, you have to put a big C in your window. And then at some point, you get a, you know, we're closing you down. But that's, that's, a, high, that's a high number. Um, so I was curious, you know, how often did restaurants get A's, B's, and C's? And, I, I, and uh, you get this chart here. You can see 13 is, all, is, the, is green, the rightmost green bar. So why are there so many 13s and so few 14s? How are these restaurants just all just skirting by, right? How is this happening? I mean, I don't know for a fact, but I'm assuming that our inspectors are, for whatever reason, helping people out a little bit, right? Okay, I'm not going to put, you know, I see, there's a big difference. A B and an A, the B means you have to be, re this is only the first inspection you go, so it's really the first time they show up in the annual inspection. Um, and I guess people are looking the other way a little bit, right? And so if you chop off the top of that green part, it actually falls beautifully and fills in the rest of it. Um, so, you know, why is this problematic? It goes back to our, to our, uh, to the, sort of biases issue that I was mentioned earlier. Um, if judgment to do this, which I think is, it sounds nice, right? Are they doing that evenly? Or are they using their own personal world experience to, to maybe, they're, maybe, you know, and, and uh, in my book I go into a little more detail and show that actually the cuisine of the food is predictive of how much of a boost you get, which you can imagine is problematic, right? Um, uh, because, it, because people tend to relate better to people more like themselves. Uh, and so, how can you fix this? Well, I would hope the Department of Health could, could actually run one of these charts for every inspector, right? Every inspector has this chart. It's gonna be dead obvious who's doing this and who's not. I don't have access to that data, they do. I pointed this out a few years ago, in fact, three now, four, oh, five. I went back and checked recently and there's no, there's no change happening, there's no difference, it's still happening. I'd like to see some sort of change to, to at least get people to kind of, you know, smooth this over because it opens the door for, you know, uh, for, for problems. And I think people, you know, don't, aren't trying to have problems even when they do. Um, by the way, the Department of Health responded to this one saying, inspectors are not instructed to offer leniency just to cite with the score is based on the extent of the violation the inspector observed. So they didn't really say anything. And by the way, if you, if you think that New York is bad, here's LA. I, I haven't had time to look into that, but it's, it's fascinating. This is the first, this is not re-inspection, it's the initial inspection. Look at the difference between 89, which has like three restaurants, and 90, which has, it's, it's, it's um, and I'm going to show you uh, uh, two more, one which, which I've discussed before and one, one which I haven't. Um, this one is, is a fun one. Uh, uh, it, was, it goes back to this story, like I told you, outliers tell stories. Right? Go and find these outliers. Um, in this case, uh, I was looking at uh, 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 fire hydrants and I was revenue that generated uh, by cars parking too close. Right? If you get within 15 feet of a hydrant, you get a ticket. Thus, every hydrant has a revenue. Right? I think so. That's fair. Uh, and then if you map the revenue of those hydrants, you get this map. Um, and I noticed a couple things, you know, one particular precinct is very aggressive about this. But also that, that some of these spots were, uh, these two hydrants were, make, were making $55,000 a year being hydrants. More than minimum wage, just being a hydrant. <laughs> now, New York had just gone through a sign redesign. All the parking signs had recently been redesigned. And I said to myself, if I was going to redesign all the signs, the first thing I would say, because those are signs that something is wrong. Aren't those the signs you want to redesign, or do you want to pay the consultant to make a fancy font and, 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 and do something, right? Do something different. 
but, it, but it, you know, the fact that this, I was the first to see this suggested to me that that was not part of our signed redesign, which, which is disappointing to me. We have all this ticket data, and we're redesigning every traffic said, look at the most confusing signs. And it's not that hard to figure out where they're confusing when people keep getting tickets in the same spot over and over again. That's a, that's a red flag. It's also a revenue source, but it's a red flag. Um, so in this case, what was it? Uh, uh, it was a fire hydrant with, a, with a, what looked like a bike lane uh, and then a parking spot. Um, and in fact, if you go up, there's little tickets on the windshield as you go through the years. You see different cars with tickets on Google. Um, and, and eventually what I learned is that that was actually not a bike lane. It was a curb extension, which is a place that people bike that is not a bike lane, um, apparently. Uh, so therefore, it was legal. And, and you know, really what we had is the Department of Transportation who thought, and the NYPD who kind of thought it didn't. And they fought about this on the, sh on the windshields of New Yorkers for, for quite a while. Um, and the Department of Transportation responded, look, we have not received any complaints. But they have, they have the data, but they haven't received complaints. We'll review the roadway markings and make any appropriate alterations. Um, and sure enough, you know, because all the complaints probably went to the NYPD, right? It, it wouldn't go to the Department of Transportation. Sure enough, they repainted the street there. Just by, just by looking at outliers, right? We can start to change our local city streets. We can start to change our local city infrastructure. Because, you know, as government officials, as people working government, the more we release, the more impact we can have. Because people can kind of help you um, um, sort through that. Um, and I want to point out that my relationship here was not one that was adversarial with New York City. And, uh, I, I was quite friendly with, with the former uh, head of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, Amin Ra. And, uh, uh, and we, we would chat a lot. And, and this kind of led to this, maybe one of the largest findings I, I had. And, and I realized the biggest, the biggest problem with this open data world that I was facing was that there was no, there's no channel for me as a, you know, in the city to communicate or ask questions to, from the city. So my only outlet was my blog. And so I put on my blog, and then the media would pick it up, and then the city would change it. But that's not, that's not healthy. Who wants that? None of you want that. I don't want that. Why are there no avenues? Where are they? Where, where, how, do, how do people using open data respond? Think about that in your own agencies. What do you want people to do with this information? We put it out there. Give them an input. Think about that. Because you, don't, you want to get to that before someone else does. And, you know. So in this case, I parked in a spot with a pedestrian ramp. Okay? It's a sidewalk curb cut, people walking the street. Now, it turns out that a certain uh, uh, passed a law maybe five or six years ago, maybe now seven or eight, that um, said that you can park in front of pedestrian ramps as long as they're not at traffic control devices, meaning stop signs, or, and there's no crosswalk. Now, the argument was that these are not safe places to cross the street. We, we're, making it, we're, we're telling people to go into the street, so therefore you can park there. <laughs> that, that, therefore, I don't understand but the rest I do. Um, so they allow people to park there. So I, I had one of these on my block, and I actually you know, was in front of a, a playground, and, the, and it didn't lead anywhere. It was just an old curb cut. I'd use it, and I'd get these tickets, and I would, you know, say, I would, I would write in and say uh, 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 my defense. Sometimes it was fine, the one time I lost, and I was like, all right, so I appealed, and then I lost the appeal. And this was very frustrating, because the law is quite clear. Um, so then I was like, all right, now we're gonna do this the right way. So I downloaded every parking ticket in New York City and analyzed the top 200 parking spots where people got blocking pedestrian ramp tickets. And I went into Google Street View, and I looked at all of them. And guess what? They were all legal. They were legal. This was three to four million dollars a year in parking tickets to legally parked cars all around New York City. So I'm sitting there thinking, what do I do with this, right? What do I do with this? this I don't have a ch Now, I happen to have a relationship from my work to the make up that phone and get in a call with them and say, hey, I'm going to publish this. I'm going to give you guys a month to formulate a response so that you're not rushing to fix this, that it's not a chaotic moment, but rather you've got a month to come up with an answer so that by the time I'm writing about this, you have a good response, not a forced response. I'm not here to cause trouble. I'm here to work with to make everyone's life better. Let's make this a win for open data. Let's say, hey, you know what? Good job, NYPD, for putting this data out, and now we can use it to make everyone's life better. Let's make this a celebration. It's a cultural shift. I know we're so used to the data being like, oh, they can see me, they can see me. But what if it's a culture shift? What if we celebrate it, right? So I did that. Um, here's an example spot there. I mapped out these spots. Um, you can see certain areas where it was, it was kind of crazy. And sure enough, uh, by the time I was writing the article, I got this from the New York Police Department, which is not always the most transparent agency. Um, Mr. Wellington's analysis identified errors the department made in issuing parking summonses. It appears to be the misunderstanding by officers on patrol of a recent parking rule. So they're going to blame the, the rule, but that's okay. We appreciate Mr. Wellington bringing the anomaly to our attention. Um, 
Thanks to this analysis and the availability of this open data, the department is also taking steps to digitally monitor these types of summonses to ensure they are being issued correctly. They also ordered refunds for uh, a good number of people, if, you know, who, who had done, and they ordered retraining of all their audits to go through for this, right? Um, and, and, you know, this was, this was, a, this was, this was a, I think this is positive. This is something good about our, our government, not something bad. This isn't a, oh, look, they're ticketing our cars. Even if the New York Post wants to write it that way, that's fine, they can. Um, but but, but this, is, this is something to be celebrated. And I want, I want to just leave you with that, that, look, I've used data for different, can, we can study how we act, we can study, and there are implications there to all of pe people and agencies and what that means for the service you give. But if we open up open data for everyone to use, we can actually see real impact. In this case, I, I understand it's parking tickets. It's not, that, it's not that impactful. But what if somebody, what if you put out all your, your street cleaning uh, routes optimizes for you? And, and say, you know what, you're, you're spending 30% more gas than you have to. Here, I come up with a new route schedule for you. Or, or trash pickup, or any of these things, right? Um, so the, the, uh, uh, and the way to really you know, help people do this is one thing that's missing most often in, in our open data is the history. There's a lot of data sets that are current, current taxi medallions. Current this, right? Anything current is not useful for predictive modeling, for understanding. We want to see the history. We want to see all ta everything back, 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 back. So anything current, you got to fix. Um, anyway, uh, look, that, that's all. I hope I've inspired you that, that releasing data can make a really big difference here. Uh, and I really appreciate you listening to my, my data stories, my anthropology, and my kind of uh, use of data to try to uh, uh, get a government to kind of change, and I hope you guys use data to change your own agencies and, and governments, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much.